Okay, so thanks, Carlo, for your presentation. See, I, I'm substituting Fabio, uh, and uh, when Fabio asked me to be to take the responsibility of the DPC manager, I was not so happy. I lose a lot of air. I mean, this is my problem. Okay, so I, I will try to explain you what we do at, at the observatory to do this kind of map, really. And uh, if you have any question, just stop me, because I will try to make a kind of uh, a fast overview. This is 10 years of my life in this talk. Anyway, so I will try to explain what we do. We start with the telemetry, package telemetry, as Fabio said, that we are serving from the satellite, from the MOC, from the Mission Operations Center. And so we have to transform this telemetry, decompress it, manage it, and try to analyze, to try to, uh, I mean, create the maps. So uh, the talks will be related to first element, say, is to flag the data, understand which data is scientific, relevant, and which one is not. Understand the beam. So understand our instrument, because the beam has the major impact in the calibration and understanding the science, really. So you have to do a very big, I mean, uh, task, photometric calibration. Your data is not in Kelvin. Your data is an engineering unit. So you need to calibrate it in a certain way. This is a, one of the most important tasks that we have at the DPC. If you don't calibrate correctly, your science results are shit. I mean, it's nothing. You cannot use it. So we have to understand very well the noise to understand our instrument. Then those elements are going to man making in the way in which you do the map. And so you have to understand on those maps what is the effect of the systematics, uh, something strange, something that you should try to remove from the map itself to extract the science. And one of the most important points that we are performing right now is to understand if the results are correct or not. What we call first internal validation and then external validation. As Fabio said, I mean, we have on a satellite two instruments made with different technology. The low frequency instrument made on the radio meter technology and the high frequency instrument. And the people that is analyzing the data is different. So the pipeline was built in a different way. If you are able to demonstrate that the results from the low frequency instrument and the high frequency instrument are in line, this is a strong uh, uh, way to tell you that your results are good are science relevant. And so I will show some types of the map characteristics and Carlo will talk about the science exploitation of that. Okay, let's to remember one element. I mean, Fabio already discussed the path to, to be here, I mean, to make this map. It's very long, very long. What we are discussing right now are only the first 15.5 months of observation. So, but remember that we are still working. We are still of getting the data. This morning I checked what was arrived from the satellite and we are at OD 1426. And with LFI, we will continue observing the sky until reaching eight survey. And this is a big, I mean, uh, uh, milestone that we attained because uh, in, the, in the past it was scheduled only to observe for 50 months, I mean, the release, the data that you have right now. HFI instead was switched off on uh, uh, January 2012. This is due to the fact that the, uh, the consumable worlds end, I mean, the helium end, so it didn't. But in any case, HFI 2 was far beyond the nominal period. So then, how to, uh, I mean, manage the data? Uh, the, the, Pipeline was logically divided in three steps, three main level, and each level has his task. The first level is the, what is called level one, it's very technical. So we got the telemetry, the packets, and these packets are divided, in, you can understand in science telemetry, so I mean the data that is acquired, and the whole skipping telemetry that tell you the parameter of the instrument. And this has retrieved from a satellite, managed, so transform it in timelines, and so store it in a database. So then the level two is more dedicated to synthesize the information. So get all the housekeeping telemetry, 
synthesize the information in few numbers, and so we create what is called the instrument operation model. It's something that tells you with few numbers what are the main parameters of the, mon the, the instrument changing with respect to the time. We, at, the, at this level, we also estimate the beam, we calibrate the data, and finally we create the maps. So then we have another level, the level three, where the maps produced by the Italian instrument and the French instrument are putting together to extract the few numbers of final that describe the, our understanding of the instrument, or of the universe, sorry. Each step is very well controlled and we had to write down something like 200 documents to describe step by step what we plan to do and what we are doing. And uh, at this level, when we perform the validation, as I, I'm repeating myself, checking the maps from the instrument with respect to the other instrument is a very strong value on the cross-instrument validation. This is a, a sketch, an overview of the pipeline that is running at the uh, uh, INAFO ATS, in our observatory. I will not go into detail if you need, just ask me. I mean, this is just level one, I summarize it in just two boxes, that's where the data is stored. So then, these are all the tasks that we are using for making uh, 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 the calibration differentiate from the data, because this, is, this pipeline is dependent on how the instrument was with, is depending strictly from the hardware. And we have a different pipeline that is called the pointing pipeline that try to tell you, try to understand where to identify sample by sample where the sample is on the sky, because you need this information to make the map. So, the first element, as I said, that you has to do on your data is to understand if your data is a, a quality, a scientific quality. And this table is trying to summarize how much data we are using, we respect the data that we are getting. And you see that we are using very large amount, this is for LFI, and uh, I will explain also what's happening in nature file. This amount of data is really I mean, we are using in LFI 90% of the data. This 8% is due to the fact that the satellite is moving. So when the satellite is pointing in a direction, so it's moving, so in the, during this period of moving, you don't have the precision needed to make the maps. But we are now studying some uh, possibility to try to uh, get also this 8% of the data inside of the scientific data to be used. And the few amount of data that we are losing are due to some strange effects that we had uh, due to cosmic rain. This is what is happening really in HFI. LFI, is, as I said, is a radiometer-based technology. HFI is based on the bolometer, so it's more sensible. What's happening in HFI is that uh, he had, uh, they had some problem with the cosmic ray that create glitches. So they, mm, they had uh, to create a special pipeline to remove those glitches, and they are discarding, discarding roughly 20% of the data due to the heat of the cosmic ray. So after you flag the data, the next step that you do, you try to reconstruct the focal plane. How do we do it? Well, we have a Jupiter. So each time we cross, we visit, we, we uh, uh, saw Jupiter, there is a team led by Francesca and Maura in Bologna that try to reconstruct our knowledge of the beam. This is precisely our, let's say, LFI instrument uh, focal plane representation. This is our our 44, 30 gigas, 70 gigas, and this is the HFI. HFI is using really Mars because Jupiter is so strong for them. And we are able to reconstruct the focal plane to minus 20 dB, minus 30 dB in case of HFI. This is information is useful because you had to reconstruct the detector pointing. So you identify uh, where your beam is in the focal plane 
Okay? So you try to reconstruct what do you see on the sky, the position, really. To do that, we use the emulify different transit of Jupiter, and so we apply also in our pipeline some strong, I mean, operation that has been done in, this, in the instrument. Why I'm saying that? Because the, any operation that you do in the instrument, like the sorption cooler switch over, where we change from a one sorption cooler to another, uh, can modify the temperature, the stability of your instrument, and this has an effect. Just to give you an example, we are applying, and this was an idea from Michele, that this is our problem solver, the wobble angle correction. The satellite, hope the satellite know where it's looking at, has a star tracker, okay? So the star tracker is looking at stars, a guy stars. You have the star tracker is looking here, and you are looking at the sky here. But this axis, uh, are, I mean, uh, can move depending on the temperature. If, if they are moving, you don't know, and so you are pointing in a different location. We identify that this happened with the, the solar system, with the, the, the movement of the satellite around the sun, and we was able to modelize that. And so we are removing right now this effect. At the moment, we have a precision of 0.5 arc min. That is very good for the instrument that we are working. This is a more advanced way to do the pointing in which we use more information, more uh, planet transit, and this at the moment is all applied by HFI. We will apply it very soon. So, but the history with the beam didn't finish. So we uh, reconstructed the focal plane, we made the detector point, but the real beam that you use to deconvolve your data is not the beam that is the representation of our plane, but it's really the beam that you see in the sky. So you have to apply the scanning strategy, the way which the satellites scan the sky. And this is called the effective beam. That is the one that is used by Carlo at the level of the window function or by the point sources guys that are asked to extract the sources from the sky and estimate in a correct way the flux of those sources. So, okay, so now you have all the information of the beam. The next step from HLFY is to understand the white noise, I mean your noise. Our data is difficult to understand because uh, the signal of the sky is very low, so it's under your noise level. So you must have a very, uh, you must know your noise level very well. To do that, we apply a kind of Monte Carlo Marco chain approach made by Davide Maino in Milan, and we estimate the noise in a time-dependent way to remove it and to use this information in the map making when we create the maps. And these are the power spectra of our noise. You can see in this picture that normally they are quite good, but we had a change here in this tail that has been due to the suction cooler switch over, when we change a little bit the temperature of the focal plane. So, you have the noise, you know the beam, what you have to do is the calibration. So transform your engineering data from Volt to Kelvin. This is the, as I said, is the most important task, and we are still working a lot on this task. You, to do that, you need a reference. In LFI and HFI, we use the same reference, the dipole. The dipole is fitted with our data. So we use a simulation of the dipole based on some parameters, and we fit our data. As this is the first result. You can see that the gain that has been computed are very, I mean, they are not good. This one are the, mi min uh, the minimum of the dipole, and so on. So we apply a kind of iterative calibration that try to correct itself, the value, try subtracting the sky, refit, subtracting, refit, and so on. And so after that we apply a, to a kind of filter, what is called OSG, optimal search of gain, to obtain the final gain. During this process, we uh, uh, convolve the dipole with our beams. So the knowledge of the beam is going 
directly in the calibration, because if you don't know very well the beam, you are not able to convolve it, and your, the results of your gain are not so good. At the moment, we are quite in good shape for the temperature. Okay. 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 Uh, calibrated. So, uh, at the final, what we create is a kind of timeline that has been, has been calibrated. So, we get, give, uh, we take this timeline, uh, if we in, in uh, a Madame map maker, that is a maximum like the fashion of map maker that subtracted the baseline of the noise. And so, we, we have the maps. As soon as you have the maps, another point that you have to understand is what I said, the systematics. Systematics are a fact that can uh, uh, be due to hardware or whatever, and you have to estimate what is the influence of those effects on your maps. This is a, a spreadsheet, very complicated, but uh, I mean, this is the spectra of what we plan to obtain. I mean, is our reference is the CMB TT power spectra. And those are the estimation in temperature of the systematics that has been simulated using real parameter. And at the moment, we don't have any of those systematics that is uh, contaminating our data. So uh, I have now nine slides showing our maps. This is, are the results of the process that I just described. This is the, our focal plane. You will see what the, the, the yellow are the radiometer that identify where the map is coming from. This is the frequency, and this is just a representation of the earth. You understand how we map the sky. This is the 30 gigahertz. So when I said that we are flagging the data, you can see in this map that is, is impressive from the quality, this stripe. This stripe has been due to the fact that in the first period of the mission, we was hit by cosmic ray, and this changed some value on the onboard software. At the time when this happened, we didn't know the cause. So what do you do when uh, you have a problem with a PC? Switch it off, and so restart. And this is exactly what we did. So here you have less data. And the, the, but so then we understood, thanks to Anna, to the instrument operation team, and so we have now a procedure that automatically check and uh, correct in case there is a cosmic ray that hit our satellite. This is the 44 gigahertz, and so you can see that the galaxy is less important. This is our tree fedor. So then, 70 gigahertz, that is impressive. And so the HFI maps, 100 gigahertz, 143, 200, 353, 545, and the 800, that it is spectacular. Those are all the nine maps together. So then, okay, so we have all the maps. LFI did his, their maps, HFI did their maps. How we check it, first check. Do one maps against the other. So 70 gigahertz maps is very near to the 100. And the very easy things is subtract one from the other. This is, is exactly the subtraction without applying anything. If the calibration is made correctly, if the uh, maps are made correctly, you will not see in the calibration, in the, in the difference, any uh, 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 CMB anisotropy. And this is really what's happened. I mean, you only see the galaxy because they are responding at a different frequency, but in the high latitude, you don't see anything. And if you try to do a zoom, this is exactly a zoom of the north part, this is the result. So this tells us that we are in line. We are doing the things with two different instruments in a different way, but the results are very good. And this was the first, and we were so excited when we did it a few months ago. So then, but we have to validate our maps internally. And I was surprised by the simplicity of this uh, uh, process and the, and the complexity of the results. As I said, you have a map, okay? 
And what you can do to understand if you are right? You can cut the pointy period in two parts. So you made a maps of the first part of the pointy period and a maps of the second part. If you subtract those parts, what you shall obtain? Nothing, only noise, because you subtract completely the sky. If this is done correctly, and the maps are done correctly, they are not affected by systematics, you will completely obtain a, a curve like this, this one. Okay? So that tells you the level of the white noise, nothing else. Really, at the, at the 30 gigahertz, we had, you can see here, and this is the main reason why we didn't deliver the polarization. Because this is not affecting, this effect is not affecting the TT, uh, the temperature power respect, the temperature, but it's affecting polarization. This tells you that there is something strange there. And this, actually, this was identified to be the side load that we didn't take in account during the calibration. This is something that we are working very hard right now to map, un minuto, to map it. Okay. This is another kind of validation. This validation has been done at the level of power spectra to cross-check if the power spectra made with a certain frequency and another frequency are in line. And this tell you, at the level of the first peak of the power spectra, this tell you that we are very, very good inside the error. This is our, let's say, the main characteristics. Uh, let, me mention, uh, let me say that we published 29 papers, so if you would like to go in there, this is all the papers that you can uh, have a look. And let me conclude. Okay, now we released the data roughly one month ago. We are now already thinking, because we didn't finish, we have to publish, we just published, I mean, 15.5 months, but we have to publish eight survey, and we have to publish a more important element, that is the polarization. Polarization is uh, 100, 1,000, uh, uh, more difficult than the temperature, because we are going in deep, really, on the data, really down the wide noise. And so we are, I mean, discussing a lot how to go in such a way, and we identify mainly this element in our pipeline to be upgraded. First, as I said, the inclusion of the side lobe in the calibration process. Have a better estimation of the beam, the, what is called the 4 pi beam, that describe you at the best, the beam. Remove the galactic stridite. This is mostly related to the HFI. They, have, they identify some analogical device uh, no linearity effect in the bolometer. This is affecting their uh, uh, polarization data. And we have to do a lot of simulation for the systematics in polarization. And uh, we have to, to optimize our zodiacal light removal. Let me just to say a few words on the people that is doing this job. These are uh, the people that are working at the OATS in our observatory. So Fabio is the main boss. I'm uh, the one that should know everything but doesn't know anything. And Anna Gregorio, she was very important. This is still important because she is the one that is sending the procedures, so has the responsibility to modify the instrument. <laughs> so it's not easy, guys. When, when they, someone calls you, there is a problem, what do you do? And to decide what you have to do with a, a satellite is not so easy. Marco Frailis is our level one man, so the ones that get the telemetry and transform it in timeline. Michele, as I already told you, is the ones that says, you have a problem? Michele applied the statistic, whatever problem, and so he solved. And it's, it's incredible, really. Samuel Davagnacco, Samuel is the ones that is making the calibration, is the most important point. And so Tavagnacco is our PhD, and Gianmarco and so on, and those guys, has been worked at the, at the observatory for a long time, so they left right now. And this is our the SISA guys, where Carlo, every knows Carlo, and I think that we are able to do this very hard job, 10 years of work, 20 years in case of Fabio, only because we are a nice person, we are discussing together, we are fighting sometimes, but is, uh, the spirit of the team is important, is 
extremely necessary, or you will never reach those tasks. And this is just to give you an overview of all the institution that is working on this project. We are about 400 people, and most of we spend our time in video conference, teleconf, because we have to talk with all those guys. That's all.